I'd like to introduce uh, Don's uh, little introductory video on uh, where Don is from, and that's the NSSL, National Severe Storms Lab, in Norman, Oklahoma. So as you take a look at that, I'll set up my uh, computer for uh, Don's presentation. The NEXRAD radars stand tall, scanning our skies. They are components of a national well, so network are, maintained uh, by the Radar well, Operations well, Center. The information provided by these radars is used by NOAA National Weather Service forecasters, the Federal Aviation Administration, and U.S. military. Forecasters at the NOAA National Weather Service use NEXRAD radar as their primary tool for observing, monitoring, and forecasting the weather. The Radar Operations Center plays a crucial role in supporting the forecasters' day-to-day -day operations. Well, in the short term, the support role of the Radar Operations Center helps us keep the radars running reliably. And in the longer term, the development and modernization efforts that go on there help move the technology forward, which then allows us to do more. The NOAA National Severe Storms Lab researches and develops new tools and techniques to improve the radar. Once proven, these new tools must be placed in the hands of the forecaster. So the Radar Operations Center is responsible for taking that research technology and implementing it on the, the national network. Uh, without them in the, the process, the research techniques that we develop here stay here. They don't make it into the operational system. And so the, the Radar Operations Center is an important uh, part of that process to make sure that things that we identify here are implemented in the operational network so all the forecasters have benefit of it. The NEXRAD program was uh, uh, a collaboration of, of three departments, Department of Transportation, Department of Defense, and Department of Commerce. Working together, they could fund this network of radars in a more economical way than each of the agencies could on their own. They also formed this uh, radar operation center with uh, tri-agency staffing and funding. In 1988, the center was established in Norman, Oklahoma. The location was based on its proximity to the National Severe Storms Lab and the University of Oklahoma's radar meteorology program. The work done by the Radar Operations Center requires a wide variety of specialties, including meteorology, engineering, programming, radar technology, and many others. A 24-hour hotline provides assistance to radar field sites across the country, as well as some international locations. Technicians also travel to radar sites, providing assistance for maintenance and support activities. Currently, the Radar Operations Center is collaborating on a major improvement to the radar network. Dual polarization technology allows the radar to send and receive both horizontal and vertical pulses. This simultaneous signal will give more information about the size and shape of particles in the atmosphere. So overall, what, what dual pole is going to do is it's going to allow the forecaster to be more accurate and be more precise with, with their forecast. They're going to know when it's going to hail and where it's going to hail. They're going to know when the, the wintertime precipitation is going to be light rain versus heavy rain versus snow and the difference between six inches of snow or maybe a half an inch of rain is, is just huge. That'll allow the forecasters uh, to say which of those scenarios is going to occur. Emergency managers then uh, are able to put salt on the roads or not and so it's really going to make the public a lot safer from that aspect as well. Acting as the bridge between research and warnings the mission of the Radar Operations Center is vital to our nation's weather safety. 
The number one goal is to keep this fleet of radars running at a very high availability rate to provide reliable data and high quality data needed by the forecasters to put out warnings for severe weather and tornadoes. be here and to talk to you. Uh, seeing that video, you see that I get to work with a lot of smart people and doing interesting things with radar. But you know, there's a component of that that I'm going to talk about today, and, and I'll call it weather propaganda. We have these new systems, and we advertise them, and they have great potential. But what I'm going to talk about today, a lot of it, is the nuts and bolts of how we make it work. And for an upgrade like dual polarization, it's on its way. We're going to field it. We are fielding it. But it's still got work that has to be done to realize those potentials that we just heard mentioned. I'm sure you maybe realize that already, but maybe I can put a little meat on the bones of those statements. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, some of this talk is going to be redundant with a very similar talk that I gave last year, except another year has transpired and we've had more adventures. But I wanted to start with an introduction because not everyone here today was here last year when I talked. And for those of you that are new in particular, you should know that all the materials that I've, or <coughs> most of the materials that I've stolen, I, I've stolen different amounts from different places, but, but a lot of the materials come from the training branch that's right in Norman. Paul Schlotter, my cohort in this dual pole presentation and one of the smart guys, uh, is going to talk after the break, uh, help put all this together, and the dual pole training materials on the web are all very good and very useful, and I encourage you to look at them if you're interested and want to see more detail. Some of the same slides I'm showing today are in those materials. Well, we've, we've had a lot of introduction to dual pole. I used to start at the beginning and say, you know, we sent out signals, pulses that were horizontally polarized, and now we want to think about vertical polarization. Well, so what? I think everyone has heard something about it now. So we can go a little more quickly, go a little further. And looking on the left, the simplest way to think about dual polarization is you transmit pulses horizontally, then you receive them, then you transmit vertically, you wait, listen, receive those. And if you're doing that with the horizontal pulses, you can see information, uh, gives you horizontal dimension of precipitation particles or information about that. And then with the vertical component, you can map out the size and shape of precipitation particles. Very neat enhancement to what we've been able to do with weather radar previously. Now down at the bottom, I said I should just go over and point here. Uh, you will notice that there's always a gotcha with this way that dual polarization was first developed, you need a fast switch to go from the horizontal to the vertical pulses. And that fast switch is expensive. And for a big network, expensive switches that go out and have to be replaced add to the cost. Also, by doing it with both horizontal and vertical pulses, it adds to the acquisition time. And all of us like uh, cheap and fast. That solution I just showed you, which, which is the traditional solution, is expensive and slow. So for the WSR88D dual pole upgrade, trying a, a different idea. That different idea is simultaneous transmission of both the horizontal and vertical signals. So we send both in the same pulse and receive it. And it's also called uh, kind of slant 45. So you're sending some vertical component and some horizontal component. So your pulse is actually a canted pulse. You can think of it that way that you're sending it out. And that's good. That means that we can go as fast as we're going now, and we don't need that fast switch. But there's still a gotcha. The problem with this solution is we have to split the power. 
because we're transmitting both vertical and horizontal. So we have a 3 dB sensitivity loss, half the power sensitivity loss. Now, I want to be clear. Sometimes people get confused between a, a power loss and a sensitivity loss. This is a sensitivity loss. It is not 3 dBz. The reflectivity, the power returns all get calibrated. Before dual polarization, 50 dBz. After dual polarization, 50 dBz, they're the same. There's no loss. This loss comes in down at the floor, the weakest returns. If previously the weakest returns you could see in a clear air mode were minus 15 dBz, now it's going to be approximately minus 12 dBz. So it's a sensitivity loss and what you're losing are the weak returns. Now those weak returns are important. We want to see boundaries. We profile the winds from, the from these weak returns. A lot of them are non-precipitation. And so it's, it's uh, not something that we like and we're working on improving it. But there's still a lot of good clear air signal with, with a loss of only 3 dB. So you're going to get lots of neat new things to look at. There are three new, new variables. They're like moments that we, that we talked about for the first Doppler implementation. There's differential reflectivity, or ZDR, correlation coefficient. Classically, we call that rho HV, but AWIPS, and a lot of this present presentation mentions what they're doing with this in AWIPS for the Weather Service. Correlation coefficient they have is CC. And then the third variable is specific differential phase, or KDP. Then there are three new algorithms. There's a melting layer algorithm, hydrometeor classification algorithm, and a QPE, quantitative precipitation estimation algorithm. And then you get nine new precipitation estimation products. So there's a lot of neat stuff. What I'm going to do is kind of go over that, show a few applications. Then we're going to have the break. Then Paul is going to come up. And he's going to sh share with you a workshop, recent cases, uh, information, I think, from multiple sites around the country where you can see some of these things in action and along with him kind of guess at, at what some of the answers are. Don't say the guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes it's still a guess. <laughs> All right, let's first look at ZDR. <coughs> ZDR is simply the ratio of the horizontal to vertical reflectivity and it's 10 log to the base 10 a db measurement uh, you can see the units the values and of course the way it works is if you have precipitation particles out there that are round let's for the moment just say those are small raindrops which are round then the horizontal and the vertical reflectivities are about the same because of the dimensions. Since we're looking at a log quantity, the log of 1 is 0. So if you have small precipitation particles, round ones, you're going to get a ZDR of about 0. Now if you've got big fat raindrops, they have a very large horizontal dimension then the horizontal component is going to be a lot larger than the vertical component, and ZDR is going to be significantly above zero. And incidentally, all the things that I'm going to tell you about, except for one little segment coming up, are all appropriate for 10 centimeter radars. When you go to other wavelengths, things change, and I'll briefly speak about that. Then, the other way, it works if you have something like an ice crystal with a vertical orientation then the horizontal reflectivity is less than the vertical reflectivity and dbz is negative I, i'm sorry zdr is negative not dbz zdr is negative zh is less than zv so we can tell a lot about precipitation particles from zdr uh, if it's a low value, it's small, those small raindrops I mentioned, but it also could be hail. If hail is round, it's going to have a low ZDR. Now, sometimes we think of hailstones as having, you know, odd shapes and they're not all round, 
but they do tumble. Even the ones with the odd shapes tumble. And so effectively, you get uh, the, the radar thinks they're the particles, uh, hail particles are more round, even if they're not. I'm going to show these for each of the, the variables. Along the top is the range of values. This is in dB. And these are the different type of particles that a radar might see. Some precipitation, some non-precipitation. And then this is the range of values that you might see. Now the good news is that we see a lot of good stuff. The bad news is we can get a lot of the same values for all kinds of different things. So ZDR by itself usually is not the complete answer. We're going to have to look at something else besides. I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. <coughs> this is a reflectivity image. A lot of these are off of AWIPS because some of this stuff comes from training for weather service forecasters. And we're highlighting three areas. So these are our AWIPS, National Weather Service color mixes, not quite the ones that I use all the time. But here's high reflectivity area. Here's an adjacent somewhat high reflectivity area, but not as high as this one. And then here's an area here, elliptical-shaped region that's low reflectivity, perhaps not precipitation. So here's the ZDRs. Where we had that really high reflectivity, we have really low ZDR. Putting those two things together, I'm going to guess that there's hail there, probably a lot of big hail right there. Right over in that next area, if you remember, it was a moderately high reflectivity, but it has a really high ZDR value. So I'm going to guess a lot of big drops. It was probably grapple, and it's melted, and it makes those big, fat raindrops on your windshield. Down here, in the clear air, the ZDR is all over the place because the biological targets are all kinds of different things. Little bitty insects that have low ZDRs, um, big birds and moths that have high ZDRs, plus it's a weak return and it's noisy. We don't talk about it, but at very weak signals, just about every one of our values is biased. Okay, second product. I didn't say it, but I think it's been implied before. If you have any questions, please stop me or I will ramble on. Um, the second product is the correlation coefficient. It's a rather tr traditional formula for calculating. I'm not going to say anything about it, uh, other than I'm going to give some, some explanation of um, generally what it means. First thing is if we have non-precipitation, we have uh, the returns that are non-precipitation have a lot of variability in them. And they're going to give us low correlation coefficients. So one thing with dual pole, I mean, right off the bat, a, a low-hanging fruit is we can separate precipitation from non-precipitation. Don't have to look at multi multiple outputs. Just look at that correlation coefficient. If it's really low, that is very unlikely that it's precipitation. And so we're using that in data quality, and, and you'll see that more and more. Now, if you have a uniform distribution of precipitation, could be all snow, could be all rain, but if it's uniformly distributed, there's not different types. If, if it's high correlation between the, the different estimates, then we get a really high correlation coefficient. I mean, I'm talking real high, greater than 0.97. For some of our work where we're trying to do things like figuring out calibration and verification, we only use values that are 0.99. So we, if, if it's nice, gentle, steady, light rain, there's very high correlation coefficients. Then the third case, the case where we've got mixed kinds of precipitation. You're in the melting layer, there's someplace else hail is falling with rain, some other, some other thing is happening. Uh, you will, if you have these mixed kinds of precipitation, then you're going to get this intermediate correlation coefficient. For the precip side, it's not as high as the uniform one, but it's still higher than the non-precipitation. <coughs> so here's an ex whoops. 
I'm going to jump the example, but not quite. So here's the way correlation coefficient looks for this same distribution of values along the top, kind of, of scatter across the uh, left edge, and all of the precipitation stuff is gathered up here. Relatively high correlation coefficient. The non-precip, except for the melting layer, are down here. So this is our data quality precipitation versus non-precipitation indicator. Sure. I don't know why this says. Paul, why does it say RF there? Uh, in, the, uh, in the middle cut, it says. Uh, oh, well, yeah, okay. It, it's for their cups. It, see, this is the color mix that's being used. And so they're just reserving that color, but it doesn't have anything to do with the correlation coefficient. They, they've just taken the, the AWIPS color mix and put it up there and put some values on okay. it. We, we still have range folding. Right, right. E even. Yeah, it's, it's just one of the colors. It, okay. It's part of the color mix, so they show it, but it doesn't have anything to do with the correlation coefficient. Good question. He gets a point. <laughs> All right. Uh, what's it used for? Again, the non-weather target's really good for telling, uh, determining that. Melting layer, it's, it's a really, for, for an operator at least, it's a no-brainer typically for the melting layer. And then if we're looking at, at giant hail or tornado debris, it's maybe our most important input. But I'm going to comment on those things a little later. But here's the melting layer example. I mean, it's the easiest way to think of correlation coefficient. This is this area of mixed precipitation. Some melted, some unmelted, and it really stands out. And if you're at some intermediate elevation angle, this one's 2.4 degrees, uh, you can see it very clearly. So in here, where we have these very high correlation coefficients, way up there, that's all rain. Okay. Now, th at this time when these examples were taken, the ground clutter cancellation wasn't working. So this is all impacted by, by ground clutter. That's fixed now, but I'm just too lazy to get a new image. But all of this high, cor high correlation coefficient is rain. Melting layer, then everything up here with, with high values is all snow. So it's pretty clear cut where the demarcations are. I mentioned the biases. Correlation coefficient is very susceptible to bias for weak signal. So you're going to see these things out here at the edge. Operators can easily learn to not look at those, but we're still teaching the computer to not pay attention to that. Yeah. Nobody would put that on the air because that would imply to the viewer that there's this area of frozen precipitation. They're not um, making the correlation that you're looking at height over distance, and so it's what what is is going to be displayed on the air for for viewers to look at. I'm not completely sure. Not much of that has occurred yet. So you folks may have some good ideas, and you can tell me. I haven't seen a lot of it on the air. Uh, some of the algorithm output may be a little bit easier to explain and to use, but we still have some of the same problems that the radar beam doesn't bend like the Earth curves, and, and down where people live, we may not be able to sense what's going on down there. So that isn't, that is, uh, as always, an issue. When you have precip aloft that's not falling at the ground, you've got the same issue. Okay. We have managed to get to the third product, and that's specific differential phase. But we need to back up. The real parameter, the real thing here, is the differential phase shift. We've got a phase for the horizontal pulses. We've got a phase for the vertical pulses. It's a calibration issue, too, but that'll come up later. But this is our differential phase shift. That's the important quantity. National Weather Service, in their, in their wisdom, has decided they wanted to just cut to the chase and go specifically to, to specific differential haze. I'll tell you why, but this is also an important parameter to look at, and I would advise people to look at it too, even though it's not an 
output by the weather service. So it's going to be specific differential phase, not differential phase we look at. Definition, it has units. It's units of degrees per kilometer. How much phase shift per kilometer? Now, you may ask, why do we have differential phase shift? Why does that occur? Well, let's think about our signal. Remember, this signal we're sending out, this slanted star, canted 45, it's got the vertical and the horizontal component, that same pulse that we're sending out. And it's going to encounter some precipitation. As that pulse propagates through the precipitation, of course, we get returned back. But the propagation speed starts to differ going through the medium. And it differs because the horizontal signal sees a lot of these oblate spheroid raindrops, and it gets impeded slightly. The vertical signal doesn't suffer from that as much, and so it gets ahead. That's what creates the phase shift. So when you get to the end, the back side of the precip, you've got a phase shift between the horizontal and the vertical. Now, uh, for, for things like calibration, knowing the total phase shift is a good thing. But again, why the Weather Service picked specific differential phase is they don't want to know the total measurement as the radar beam goes out 250 kilometers. What's really most important is to know where is that limited area where all that phase shift occurred? Because that's going to turn out to be the important thing we're looking for because that means that there's a lot of liquid water, a lot of rain that impeded that horizontal signal and created that phase shift. So we're looking for, th for the gradient, the derivative of the total. And that's how we get specific <coughs> differential phase. Saying the same thing here, uh, we start out with a phase. It's actually not zero, it's above zero. And then we go through. Here's where all the phase shift is. You got here, there's anything else. We want to know about this part. Now, KDP is a very useful parameter. It's immune to, to partial beam blockage. Uh, some of our other signals, as you know, reflectivity in particular, we have a lot of problems with, with partial beam blockage. KDP is immune to that. I have a great example, which I don't have time to show you, from a Vortex 2 data case where we went out chasing storms in the hills and trees of eastern Oklahoma on a tornado day, May 10th, 2010. Greg Forbes will remember. And our reflectivity data through up through about four elevation angles isn't worth a flip because of all that stupid beam blockage. But we've got KDP data, and we can see the distribution of what's going on and how the storm's evolving through looking at the KDP data. So it's neat stuff. It's also immune uh, to this partial beam blockage, uh, this attenuation issue I already mentioned. It's immune to calibration problems that we're suffering with in, in lots of areas. <coughs> and it's somewhat immune to the presence of hail, wet hail. Of course, it's going to have some rain, but in general, it's only responding to the rain. Okay, so here's what it looks like. And the values typical at, at S-band go from when we get significant rain from 1 up to 3 or 4. If you get way up here, way high, that's rare. So if you get a KDP or 2 or 3, that's, that's uh, really raining. If KDP gets to 4, you might ne need to build a boat. And that's much different than these other precipitation particles. So this is your rain indicator. If you want to know where the heavy rain is, here's another case where you can just look at one output. For the non-precip scatters and returns, it feels very noisy. We do a bunch of averaging. Since this is a gradient, a derivative, it's very noisy all the time. So we have to do averaging, but we can't even fix these with averaging. So, so there is no display in the clear air for KDP. Because again, we're after the rain. I think that says the same thing. When I steal these, sometimes I forget they come in parts. Okay, so here's our example again, or, or a similar example. Here's some 
areas of high reflectivity and, and pick some, some different ones. Um, there's also some reflectivity down here, but it's not highlighted. And then over here is all of this lighter return, a lot of it probably non-precip. So we can look at KDP. First thing is there's no KDP down here. That's all clear air stuff. Here is some precip. Here is some bigger KDPs. This is where the heavy rain is. This is moderate values. If you remember, these were high reflectivities. So it's probably got a lot of hail in it. But the, but the amount of rain, the amount of liquid water is not as high. Now there's some high uh, reflectivity right over here. And notice that we have some blanks in the field. Again, this is a derivative, a gradient. It can suffer from those kinds of issues. If the field is too unstable, even after smoothing, we don't display the result. So there will be a, a few times when you go to see the value you want in a particular place and don't see it. Also, another thing catches my eye, just looking at this, here's another high rain area out here. Just jumps out at you. Okay, we've got three algorithms. We've got melting layer, hydrometeor classification, and of course they have acronyms, and quantitative precipitation estimation. They're all in big print. But don't, don't you just love the asterisk and the small print that goes along? In this case, it is. These algorithms in the WSR88D are all run in the RPG, which is at the sites, not, not at the RDA, not at not where the, where the uh, transmitter and receiver are. And the level two data that all of us use gets scooped off at the RDA. So if you get level two data, you'll get the information from the dual pole moments. They've been calculated, but you won't get the algorithm outputs. When I spoke last, year I said there's a lot of questions about private sector television and using dual pole because you're not initially going to get the algorithm outputs unless the vendor you're with codes these up and makes them available to you. Now you can get archive level three if you want some outputs. There are some of the outputs, outputs particularly the QPE, the precip. But as you know, they're delayed, they say, one to three minutes. Uh, my, my informal sample is usually three minutes or more, so sometimes they're maybe not quite as timely as you want to have them. So I don't give recommendations, but if I was to give recommendations, I would say work with a vendor, work with a good vendor, and have them implement these things. Also, I'm going to spend a lot of the rest of this talk telling you these things aren't very good, and we're going to have to improve them. So as we improve them, then those... Vendors are going to have to follow along, improve them, and go through this process to get the good stuff and get all the output. <coughs> that's not a great rate way to run a railroad, but that's the way that it's being done. Okay. I'm going to kind of start from the top down because one algorithm leads to a second and uses that information into the third, uses the first two, and so forth. So the first one is the melting layer algorithm. Now, I told you, and I showed you a picture, that that's an easy thing to see. You look at a, a correlation coefficient, and it just jumps out at you where, where the melting level is. So it's easy for the human computer in our head to see it, but we're still working to completely teach the digital computer to see it. Because we have some, some issues that, that occur in real life. You might have multiple zero degree levels. Uh, you might have a very broad uh, uh, isothermal layer and, and things that start to and confuse the computer. So for the weather service, and I hope the vendors who code these things up do the same, it needs to be selectable what you're going to use for that melting level value. Because if you pick the wrong value, then the two algorithms underneath, garbage in, garbage out. So the operator can select for the weather service at the RPG 
Well, if you use the melting layer algorithm, if they're looking, pretty easy to see if it's, if it's a simple case and it's working right or it's a more complicated case and it's not working so well, then you can go with a ruck sounding. Right now for the weather service, it's just ruck, but there's other, other good mesoscale models and, and uh, folks can get their hands on those. Or you can use a balloon sounding. But whatever, you need to pick the one that's best because if the melting layer isn't right, then it affects other things. And I'm going to show you what melting layer output looks like. This is a case of a nice, pretty simple uh, melting layer. And the melting layer detection algorithm does a good job. And it has displays for the center where the edge is first encountering, or where the beam is first encountering and the beam is last encountering the melting level based on calculation of the volume. And, and as, as a human computer, you can see these mixed phase regions both here and here, kind of along this band of precip with higher correlation co coefficients in, in here and somewhat higher out here, and, and, and it, but it, there isn't a whole lot of data uh, above the freezing level. Well, southwest and northeast or something. So this is what it looks like. Weather service people will be looking at these. You all will be looking at whatever your vendor provides. All right, next algorithm. Next algorithm is hydrometeor classification. And none of these algorithms are mature, but the HCA is the most immature. It's got a tough job to do. It's trying to decide what is the dominant scatterer in each each of the gates, each of the volumes where we make an estimate. And it uses fuzzy logic because there are overlaps. It's using all of the variables, all of the information, and it's putting it together and making best guesses. Now, one thing that's good about it is that there is an estimate for each gate at each elevation angle. So if you're really a sophisticated user, like a numerical modeler, and you want to verify your numerical model, I mean, our output's good, you can, you can do that everywhere in the atmosphere, or everywhere with, within the, the volume collection pattern. So here are the current classification outputs. Now, the more are possible. Uh, in Europe, they're, they're more advanced in this dual pole business than we are in the US. I attended a a European radar conference a year ago, and the, I forget who it was, maybe the Swiss had 44 categories in their hyd hydrometer classification algorithm. Now about 20 of those were birds and insects. There's only so many ways you can cut up the precip, but you can cut up the non-precip stuff into a, into a lot of things if, if you want and you're smart enough to do that. We're not doing that yet, as you can see, we're lumping it together, but in the future, for ornith ornithologists and others who want to make studies, there's a lot more stuff that we can do with this dual pole to help them. So what we're outputting now, and these are the colors that are in the weather service color mix. Don't know about anybody else. There's light to moderate rain, heavy rain, hail, big drops, these big fat hamburger shaped drops, the melting grapple. You want to know about those because they get really high reflectivity but they don't produce a lot of rain. So it's good for the operator to know about them, and it's really good for precipitation estimation algorithm to know about them. Gropple, ice crystals, dry snow, wet snow, can't make a decision. That does happen. AP or ground clutter. We have clutter residue, and then we have clutter filters. I'm going to talk about that. Uh, and of course, we all know we get AP under proper atmospheric conditions, and then all of this stuff gets lumped under biologicals, which can be broken in, into smaller segments, but is not now. We can't get these, these first few right, so probably no reason to go to the others. Now, we are going to add one. Of course, adding and quickly don't necessarily go together with the government. <laughs> but not Bill 13, which is the first dual poll bill, but Bill 14, which is a year and a half away, hopefully, uh, will probably have a tornado debris category added because it's something we can see pretty easily. And it's sexy. Everybody likes that, and so we're going to add that. We had a big tornado year, so 
government wants to show they're doing better, one thing we can do is show a tornado debris category. Craig mentioned we, we've got these challenges with, with showing dual pole output to the public about what's going on. And this is an example of part of that challenge. Our radar beam doesn't bend at the same rate the Earth curves, so if you get very far away from the radar, you're looking up higher. And you may show something that's not occurring at the ground. You may be in a melting layer, whereas below there's a shallow layer of cold air and you've got freezing rain, but you don't know. You might have warm rain. Who knows? So that's definitely a challenge. We have a big challenge in verification. Again, we need to know the answers up here to see how well we're doing. <coughs> we get these answers down here that have the limitations. So what we need to do is to fly an airplane up there. Problem is we haven't had an airplane to fly. We had a research aircraft, a T-28. Some of you old-timers may remember it got old and isn't used, hadn't been used for some time now. But we're right on the verge of getting a new aircraft. NCAR, South Dakota School of Mines, have an A, uh, and the military, Air Force, uh, are going to have an A-10 Warthog aircraft, which is a perfect aircraft for this kind of work. It's got a lot of armor plating. It can go slow, uh, do all the neat things we'd like to have done. So starting as early as next year, there is a checkout for that, for that plane. And hopefully we'll start seeing more and more data where they fly through precipitation at altitude and, and with the sensors on board the craft, they can tell us what kind of precipitation particles. And with that verification, certainly be a component in our doing better. Put that into our fuzzy logic. Okay, here is uh, precipitation. Again, these, these are kind of old, outdated. I'm still using them. This is reflectivity. Uh, these are supercell-like storms. Here is the <coughs> output from HCA for the classifications. You can see the different categories. The hail stands out. You can see the heavy rain, light rain. You get above the freezing level as you get out there, but you get all kinds of answers. I, I, I've kept this one, even though things have gone beyond this. I've kept it because it's a good example of how tough this is and how often we still make mistakes at this HCA business. You can look at a higher elevation angle. This one's up three, this is now three degrees. So we're mostly above freezing. You see a lot of dry snow now, but you still see some, some grapple hail categories as you should. These are probably better answers. A little easier up high to get the categories right, but there's occasional miss even there. Now, for certain uses like uh, precipitation estimation, QPA, we do averaging. So if, there, if the number of misclassifications is a reasonably small number, we can average through it. Not always. Okay. Third is the QPE algorithm. And this is the one that, that maybe has the most attention, sold to a poll on the fact that we could estimate precipitation better. So by golly, we ought to be able to do that. This is a rule-based algorithm. The rules have changed. They're going to continue to change for a while because as I'm going to show you, we still don't have it quite right. It uses reflectivity, differential reflectivity, and specific differential phase all three in different categories, different times, different ways, and there, there's nine new products that are coming. Uh, uh, for the new products, uh, generally they match the legacy products, so we didn't want to create things that work different, look different. Uh, they're instantaneous rate, there's user selectable duration products, things you're familiar with. There's different products, which are really neat, interesting to look at. Again, for weather service users, they're going to have these and we'll be looking at them. Important point, this is for the weather service, but for anybody who uses this, I wouldn't throw away the legacy products just yet. I'm going to show you some times where legacy is better <laughs> than dual pole. I know that's heresy, but that's the truth. And so I, w I would continue to look at these some as well and compare. Now, this is work that was done to set this up. All very good research work. 
done in, in Oklahoma. It's the only place we had a dual pole radar, at least in the 48 states, that, that was available for this kind of thing. And we developed some nice results. Uh, there's several different curves along here. The two to pay attention to are the blue and the red. Uh, the, the blue is, is reflectivity with a PPS, the, the traditional reflectivity only. The red one is the uh, QPE algorithm using KDP, Z, and ZDR, and, and using it in various ways. And if you look at the root mean square error, that error is lower until you get out to a pretty far range away from the radar for, for the QPE. <coughs> Good. And if you look at the bias, it's generally unbiased till you get out here a ways. And then it goes to an underestimate, as does PPS, because as you go above the freezing level, you're not going to correlate very well anymore with the stuff below the freezing level. That looks good, and that led to first, to first uh, algorithm deployment. But if I don't put you to sleep, I'm going to show you some more details of how we we're still need to work on it. Now, here's an example. I always like to show something positive. This is from Moorhead City. This is Hurricane Irene making landfall. Uh, these are the rain gauges, the HADS rain gauges, <laughs> that, that were collected by uh, the Weather Service, the system. And so you can overlay the storm total precip on the gauge rainfall totals. Now, I haven't set it up to now, but I'll talk some more about there's rain gauges and then there's rain gauges. I told you verification was tough because we didn't have good data above the ground. I really implied that our data at the surface were good. Some of our, some of our rain gauge data is not, it's not so good. I, I get to live in Oklahoma. Kristen's not here, but she and I would tell you we're among the privileged few. We get to live in Oklahoma where they have a really good rain gauge network. We have a meso network that's a gold standard for rain gauges. Dynamite stuff. Go anyplace else, of course I'm biased, I don't think it's as good. If your, rain, if your rain gauge data isn't very good, then we're going to have a lot of trouble even verifying this stuff. Cases in point. Here are the <laughs> gauges that the Weather Service got. This is the official result for Hurricane Irene. Here's a 13.1 inch amount adjacent to a two tenths of an inch amount. Doesn't make meteorological sense to me. Uh, here's some other, here's three tenths. Um, if you pick selectively, for these gauges, you might say we have a fairly good correlation. This brightest color here, northeast of Moorhead City, where the hurricane ma made landfall, kind of pivoted as it went north, we have values of about 15 inches storm total. And I see a 14.79, a 15.74, 15.66, but just gives you a feeling for how tough this verification is. It's hard to be objective can't average those. I just have to pick and choose. Well, you get subjective and it gets, the world gets tougher. So if you ever get a chance, vote for rain gauge networks. <laughs> I, haven't seen, I haven't seen it either. Gonna, we're, we're all going to have to work on that. All right. Right quick applications. I'm going to look at some things there, being a storm freak. I, I just love to see the different storms. In Oklahoma, we had a flash flood back in June of 2010. Big heavy rain caused lots of problems, as they always do in metropolitan areas. This is the PPS, uh, the, the, the estimates we've had before, the legacy, so-called legacy estimates, and it's using 300R to the 1.4 relationship. For those of you who know relationships, that's a continental relationship. This was, this was a case where we had lots of moisture, so it was kind of semi-tropical relationship. Uh, in the, in the uh, precipitation processing system, you can change those relationships. People don't always change them. And so that's another advantage with dual pole. You don't have to worry about changing relationships anymore once we're into dual pole. But anyhow, you can see the amounts. The maximum amounts there are fours and fives and sixes mostly, but if you see here, now 
these are the micronet gauges. There's a meso network in Oklahoma done by Oklahoma Climate Survey and a micronet. These are in the micronet, and you see values almost 10 inches for the biggest one I see right there. So it was underestimating. PPS was underestimating. Here's dual pole, and uh, there's a bunch of 6, 8, 9, almost 10 inch amounts kind of in the right place. So just a qualitative look, it's doing better. And we lived with these qualitative looks for a while, but we're now doing quantitative looks. That's still coming. The easiest thing, maybe the most fun thing out of this, and this is something last year when I played the game of find something in the data. For those of you who were here last year, showed your reflectivity, and I showed you four different cells and, and said, tell me which one of these is the heavy rain producer. Well, it might not just jump out at you. Here's ZDR might not just jump out at ZDR either. There are some high ZDRs, there's some big drop regions, but there's some areas that are, that are intermediate, quite a few. If you look at correlation coefficient, there's generally high correlation coefficients. It's a rain situation. If you look at KDP, to me, it just jumps out. There's the heavy rain. That's the one, that's the place. If you're gonna issue a, a urban flash flood statement, if you're going to issue a, a weather advisory or if it meets criteria, a flash flood warning, there's your info. So we do, we do have a lot of good stuff. I think it's my job to talk about our warts and wrinkles some, but I don't want to ever underplay the fact that we have something really good out there that, that uh, forecasters, meteorologists can use right now. I mean, this is a lot better than we've ever had before. A lot better than looking just at reflectivity and trying to figure out with some relationship where the heavy rain is. Okay, thunderstorm examples. If you look at vertical cross sections, you have to, of course, create them special, but if you create them, or if you just look at, at uh, uh, intermediate elevation angles that are, that are part of them, you see column features. And those column features are related to updraft. You see differential reflectivity columns, and, and you see specific differential phase column. So these are our ZDR. Here's our reflectivity. Here's our melting level. You can see it. This, so beyond the melting layer, out where ge things are generally frozen, we see these areas of high ZDR. Why do we see them? Those are the updraft areas. We have super cool liquid, un unfrozen raindrops up there or just in the process of freezing and we get these high ZDR values. So if you look at a vertical cross section, you have a column. We're cutting through that column. Neat stuff. This is specific differential phase, same thing. KDP, again, is not very sensitive to the mixed phase stuff. You don't see much for the melting layer, but you do see higher liquid water in those updrafts above the freezing line. And, and the height of these and the magnitude of these gives you at least some qualitative information about the strength of those updrafts and how they're changing. So here are the, some vertical sections. This is through a supercell storm. And this is range. This is height. So here is a really nice ZDR column. I'm guessing the freezing level is down in here somewhere. And you can see this is well above the freezing level. And you can see extending down to the ground. These are probably big drop regions extending down to the ground. And here's a mature updraft, and this is probably a developing flanking updraft. So here's the ZDR part. Here's the KDP part. Higher KDPs here. You can see all that liquid, and you can see where it's falling to the ground. Right down there is your heavy rain. So they're very useful. Uh, you've got to dig a bit to look at it, but if you do, you can monitor updraft strength. The first thing you're going to see when those updrafts are growing, even before you get high reflectivity, you're going to see some ZDR and KDP information and can give you some lead time. If you're really into the minute-by-minute the minute lead time business, there is potential in these kind of outputs. Okay, the tornado debris signature getting kind of well known. I think a lot of examples were seen this warm season in our big tornado year. It's a fairly uh, easy 
to the pig thing when it's there. Not, nothing's ever completely easy, but fairly easy. Here's the reflectivity, hook echo. Here is uh, ZDR, very low value of ZDR. Why would it be low? Debris got all these random orientations. There's no set orientation. There, there's no um, place where, where we have hor horizontal uh, polarization much higher than vertical like we do up here. This, this is, this is the so-called ZDR arc of big drops in supercells. Tells you a lot, but I'm not going to go into it. But there's a lot of difference between that or the rain areas and that little donut hole. That little donut hole is debris. Here it is in correlation coefficient, day in and day out, wavelength independent. Correlation coefficient is a little better than ZDR, but, but they're both pretty good. And, and there's where it shows up in correlation coefficient down to very low values. It's not precipitation. Now, I'm going to tell you in a minute that what you need to do is always look at velocity first if you're looking for a reflectivity signature because there's a lot of little things in dual pole data and if you're just looking at the dual pole outputs only you could get confused we're still working through about the signatures the details of the signature might find some new things with vortex 2 data as we keep analyzing that we're starting to get a few mature analyses yet haven't seen any new stuff jump out but but we're wading our way through analyzing those data and we may learn more so this is an example. This is one from last year when we were playing around. This is May 10th, uh, east of, of uh, Norman. First, you go to the velocity signatures. And here's three humdinger velocity signatures. Right here, right here, and right here. It's e those are either called humdingers or barn burners, one of the two. <laughs> and you can see where they are in reflectivity. You go over to ZDR and... This is why I tell you, don't look, at the Z, don't look at the dual pole variables first. Once I kind of know where to look, yes, all those values are relatively low, but they don't just completely jump out at me like that first example I showed you. Here is correlation coefficients. Maybe a little better because some of these do kind of jump out at me, but it, it's, this is a, an output that's best appreciated when you look at it with the, <coughs> with the multiple outputs and when you start with the velocity first. Now, for some of these classic supercells, like this one, except maybe a little better for some of them, when you have a debris ball that's unfortunately going through a town or a metropolitan area, it becomes very simple again. But if you're trying to see them all, it, I have that recommendation. Okay, a winter storm. I showed this last time. We, ha we haven't had a better winter storm in central Oklahoma, so I keep showing the <laughs> old one. We, we had a really... Nice, if you're a weather freak, blizzard in central Oklahoma on Christmas Eve 2009. F for, for everybody, this was not a good situation be because it, everybody was traveling. There were fairly good forecasts, but they didn't say stay home or you'll lose your life. Maybe they should have be because it got life-threatening, and unfortunately there were people who died in this blizzard. But here, here are some data in central Oklahoma. I have some different parameters on here. Wind temperature. These are on the hour precipitation uh, types at, uh, at uh, OKC at Will Rogers Airport. Then down at the bottom are snow, uh, snowfalls, hourly snowfalls as reported again at the Oklahoma City site and their accumulated snow. So that for us this was, this was that humdinger of a storm. Uh, we started out above freezing, had light rain in the morning, the, the very classical go to freezing rain, sleet in the mixed phase region. Then about noontime, we went to heavy snow, and I'm talking really heavy snow, and it was occurring while the wind was over 50 knots, over 60 miles per hour. So we, we had snowfall rates as high as 3 inches per hour with those high winds, and you can see the accumulation going up. We had... 14-inch accumulation and three, four, five-foot snow drifts. So traffic was completely uh, stopped. And it occurred during the day when people were trying to travel. So let's look at some radar data. This is from 
K-O-U-N, Central Oklahoma, middle of the day. This is reflectivity. Over on the right is correlation coefficient. And, of course, the game is where is the, the uh, melting level, the mixed phase stuff, and where does it go to all snow? With reflectivity, you maybe get some ideas, but with correlation coefficients, you get a much better idea that everything over in here has some mixed phase attributes, but right around the radar, over in here, over in there, that's all snow. Now, there is a little zone here that, that shows some, some mixed phase. I'm not sure what those are. Those may be really big aggregates because these are very high reflectivities, up to 40 dBZ. Apparently, all snow, at least as reported by surface observers. Some of this coming over Will Rogers is what produced the three inches per hour amounts. So its correlation coefficient is very useful, particularly for an operator, to determine precipitation type. Here's another example. I think this is from the same event. Uh, this is slightly earlier. And this, sh this shows the time. He here the, the melting level is much easier to see, but you see that this wedge is knocked out of it. This is where it's below freezing. Up at, up at the airport, which is right up here, it's already snowing. Where I lived, down in here, still got mixed phase stuff. And then southeast of there, I think they had freezing rain still. Okay, I told you I was going to say a little bit about 5-centimeter radar and, and 3. I play with 3-centimeter radar uh, on board mobile vehicles on trucks, but some of you, television I know, have 5-centimeter radars, and some of you may be looking at dual polarization for 5-centimeter radar. And I don't want to dissuade you, but I do want to tell you life is a little more complicated at those wavelengths, and it's those darn laws of physics again. They come back and give us trouble. The full radar equation is ugly, and the scattering equation, we don't want to deal with it. We, we want to make the Rayleigh approximation, which we generally can at 10 centimeter wavelength, as long as those particles are less than a, a tenth of the radar wavelength, then, then we can use a much simplified equation. We like to do that. And I'll show you what it means when we, when we don't do that. But at 5 centimeter and 3 centimeter, we have to use the full me scattering formulation. And I'll show you what that means. These are effective diameters, backscatter cross sections. Black is S band, blue is C band, red is X band. This is for uh, dry precipitation particles, these are for wet precipitation particles. And you see that there are some differences. There are also some nulls and all kinds of crazy things in that scattering equation that, that uh, we don't like to deal with, but, but have to be dealt with, particularly at the lower wavelengths. You can see the, the response at S-band, although it's got still some, some things, is, is uh, not near as complicated as the shorter wavelengths. And then, if you go over here and you look at some, some uh, modeling output at equivalent diameter, First for ZDR on this scale, and then down at the bottom, equivalent diameter versus KDP, specific differential phase. And you look again with the same color categories, you'll see that X band has a nice, somewhat linear response. Even the red X band is a little better. Some of the things we do with X band, although we, we have issues. They're not quite as bad as C-band. You'll notice the C-band response has got this giant peak out here at, at these size particles because they're just at the right, si the right size to have what's called resonance scattering, and it produces strange responses. So you can see s get some higher ZDRs. That's not necessarily so bad. But you come down here and look at something like KDP, and you'll see as your diameters get larger, it goes from higher to lower to higher again. You can't even count on a linear relationship. Now, these things aren't hopeless. They can be overcome. We do corrections at X band. And again, I'm biased because I'm a part of doing it. But, but I will tell you that I think they're pretty darn good. And we're getting a tremendous amount of information uh, about precipitation uh, microphysics 
from the X-band radars, and I'm sure we can do it at C-band too. I just don't know how far along in the development everybody is on that. I know where I live, we're not completely through with that development for the C-band stuff yet. Okay, let's look at some of these issues for associated with the upgrade. Okay, we've got 30 minutes left. So y'all either ask the question or I'm going to show you a lot of details. <laughs> uh, thank you, yeah, thank you. Thank hard. Uh, there's a lot of things that, of course, we can't do. mentioned the laws of physics, those limitations. We can't do perfect rainfall estimation. We can't do exact hail sizes, although we're working on that. This business of getting surface precip type when our radar data is aloft, we've got issues. We don't have a debris signature for every tornado, although at close range to the radar, Paul and I were talking about this morning, even some minor tornadoes now in areas where you've got something to be picked up. Uh, he was telling me of a case of Atlanta for weak tornadoes, and, and down in that area there's trees and stuff, and uh, had dual pole signatures. So, so we're still learning how many do and how many don't, but I'm pretty sure we can't detect every tornado, and of course not predicting tornadoes. But what dual pole has to do and this is the battle we've been fighting, is it has to be calibrated. This is a big, complicated enhancement. We're putting in new plumbing. We've got two channels for transmit and receive. And everything's got to be balanced, got to be calibrated. We need ZD, ZDR, this is maybe the most important, it's in red, ZDR with an accuracy of one or at most two-tenths dB. If we don't have that, then, then we're going to make too many errors, and particularly our algorithm outputs are going to go down the tube. I'll show you. The other thing that's important as far as calibration is differential phase. We have to have an initial differential phase in both channels, and those have to be balanced because we're assuming we're starting with the same phase. If we don't start with the same phase, if they're already imbalanced, then we're going to get an improper differential phase. We're doing better with this one. We had some problems with it for a while, but it's in the white. This one's still in the red. Now, all this comes down then to both the, the kind of hardware we put in and maintaining that hardware. We, we have to go mostly with automated calibration routines. We can't calibrate li like we'd really like to, and the tech manuals are still being worked on. All of those LTACs at all of those radar sites have got to be able to maintain this sucker and fix it and most important, they've got to figure out, or got to figure out with help of the meteorologist, when it's starting to go in, into Never Never Land. Now, there's a sensitivity loss. Uh, at first, the contractor had a huge sensitivity loss that slowed the program down. We've got that down now where it needs to be, and, and we're working on methods to, to even get maybe another dB or two back. Okay, so you know we blew the first schedule told you that last year. We blew it by a couple of years. So what have we been doing? Well, we've been working on the ZDR calibration, differential phase calibration, something else I haven't mentioned up to, up to now, even though we try to put these in, in, uh, in areas where we can control temperature, that doesn't always occur. So the components and the outputs are temperature sensitive, and as temperature changes, then, then that changes calibration things, sometimes in ways that we have trouble handling. Uh, we, we'd like to do the full system calibration that some other kind of radars do. When we take our little X-band radar out and we want to calibrate it, we just point it vertically in light rain. Since we know those characteristics of light rain, it tells us whether we're good or bad and how far off we are. Unfortunately, the WSRD8D was not built to point vertically, so we can't use, that's called the bird bath technique, because right? the antenna looks like a bird bath at that point. So if somebody ever talks about that, we can't do the bird bath technique. Now there is a cross polarization technique that NCAR uses. It's much easier when you have the switching than, than when you send the canted signals, but it's being worked on. But I've said for a year, we're gonna get something soon. We still don't have anything from that yet. So I don't know how long. Uh, We've beat on the KRUN radar for years, and I think we've got it 
to where it now may be a tenth of a dB, dB calibration that we want. But I would bet many that there's probably no other radar in the fleet that's that quite that good yet. Um, when we think about ZDR and think about this calibration business, we have to work with the calibration system that's in the radar. So the true ZDR is what we measure, plus or minus, whatever, the calibration value, the change that comes from calibration. And that, that change comes from an offline calibration that's done, not, not as often as I would like, but then there's real issues for that. Th those those LTECs have to maintain lots of equipment. They can't just sit there and, and baby that radar as I would like them to do. But they make an offline, full calibration as best they can, in injecting signals. And then we do have uh, a, a short retrace check, and then we have a more full eight-hour check. Now, we've always had eight-hour checks. Some of you may or may not have known that occasionally your data would look a little delayed, maybe by up to a minute. That was that eight-hour calibration recheck going on. With dual pole, it's more significant, and it's no longer gonna, every eight hours that you're not going to lose a minute. You're going to lose maybe three or four minutes while you go through that process. But bear with it. It really needs to do that to see when the calibration is changing so we can compensate for that. So that's how we get the, RD, the ZDR system that we subtract. So in a perfect world, with perfect calibration, we, m we make a measurement, we apply the, the ZDR system, the calibration number, and we come up with a perfect ZDR output. How do we check that? I told you about our limitations. Well, there's one thing that you can do, is you can look at light rain. Again, light rain with these small raindrops should have a, a fairly predictable ZDR value. We expect a value of 0.23 at 20 dBz. Now, remember reflectivity is proportional to the number times the diameter to the sixth power. So you can get 20 dBz with a few large particles, which messes up the relationship. But if you average enough, and if you try to make sure you're looking at a light rain case, which we do, this is how we're doing some of our verification work, we should expect our ZDR to be about there. Here's a case from Vance Air Force Base, one of the first beta sites, and its 20 dBz value was up here, 0.65. Should have been 0.23. It says after all the calibration number, everything's been done, our estimate of ZDR error, 0.42. And again, we want 0 0.1, 0 0.2 at the max. So not very good for that radar at that time. That's why there's been a lot of work doing a lot of things to try to improve these. Here's another radar. This is in August. This is Moorhead City. And we got about 0.45, where we should get 0.23. So we're down now to about 0.22, getting better. Some, uh, some other radars and the trend in the radars, a lot of things have been done. A lot of people have worked hard. Good things have happened. Now, I've just shown you something really interesting. I showed you Vance Air Force Base in the center of the country, and I showed you Moorhead City on the coast. And I've got these plots. These are ZDR values versus reflectivity, and we don't just look at 20. We plot out a whole bunch of them. And by the way, these are correlation coefficients have to be as high as 0.99. Make sure we're looking at just rain. And we're looking at a range where we can make good measurements. We're looking at 2.4 degrees elevation. We're out of any residual ground clutter. And we're looking at heights below 2.5 kilometers because we don't want to get close to the melting line. So it should be our best data. And I show you this distribution. Then I just showed you that distribution. And they look a lot different. Why, why would they look different? And what is that trying to tell us besides just the 20 dBc? Something we can really, really use. This is a continental system, precipitation system, and the drop size distribution is much different than the one at Moorhead City. Remember that reflectivity factor is the number of particles and the diameter to the sixth factor. If we have lots of big particles, 
we're going to get high reflectivities. If we have a lot of small raindrops with low ZDRs, we're not going to get as high reflectivities. We have drop size distribution information. Working with modelers now, or everybody's working with modelers now where I live, and they can start using that information in the models. So there's another thing still in research, but we're going we're gonna to make some hay with that over time. Okay. Here is at that Vance Air Force Base, the first site we went to after KOUN, and after some hard hardware upgrades that were made to try to fix some of our calibration issues, this is how our ZDR error has gone, a function of time for rain events with all those caveats like I told you, lots of volume scans in each event, goes from August through October. You can see that our error went from about 0.4, it's kind of come down gradually to where we're getting some good estimates. And those are the kind of trends we like to see. Of course, we worked on this radar quite a bit. All right, let's look at some rain gauges. Uh, I maybe have too much, so I'm going to skip through this, but I need to tell you that for, for trying to do verification of the QPE algorithms, we've concentrated on three sites. KRUN, because we've had it for a long time, and we've made it better. Vance Air Force Base, because we've also had it for a fairly long time. And then Wichita, because uh, we've had it for quite a while. So we've looked at those three. They're all continental. We haven't gotten into the tropical biz yet, except for that kind of output I showed you. Here are the kinds of statistical techniques that we're using. We're also doing some resampling things to make sure that, that our cases are good. But look at these large number of radar gauge pairs. Another thing that can get you a small sample size. We've got a lot of gauge pairs here. So here are results for KOUN. These are dual pole, and then these are the, the PPS processing system. When you collect level one and, and then process the data forward, if, as we've done, you can process both systems, po both kinds of things completely. And the legacy system has more scatter. You can see that the points are, are distributed. Uh, this is the radar estimates, and these are the gauge estimates, and if we were perfect, they'd all lay along the same line. So if you look at the Rootening square, square Error, the RMSE, and we look at the PPS, and we look at the dual pole, and we look at the first the whole set of data, and then we look at, at various parts of the data, higher and higher rainfall amounts, then we can look and s see if there are differences, are they significant. With KRUN, our best radar, looks like we're doing a better job. You can see for, for all of the rain categories, as you divide it up, we're doing better. Good stuff. We can also look at the bias. That's KRUN, that's PPS. KRUN stays a little higher as we get out to, to longer ranges. PPS doesn't. Again, looking at the statistics on bias, shows that KRUN is doing better. All good news. We like KRUN. Another interesting thing to do is take a particular gauge and look at it volume scan by volume scan, so instantaneous rates. This was a, a big supercell, or actually a train of supercells along a stationary front occurred in Oklahoma in the spring, and there was a high rainfall amount, nearly six inches. This is the rate and the final accumulation for legacy and then for dual pole. Now, we're not perfect. As we get high reflectivities in here in hail, we're not accumulating much rain. PPS is really accumulating a lot, but even dual pole is accumulating too much. We're not accounti accounting enough for the hail that was there. And you see then those things continue on. You can't ever recover, even though our trends are pretty good. We get right at the end, we're also overestimating for some reason. I'm not quite sure what the deal is. You need an airplane to fly through that. So we overestimated the big rain with dual pole, but not nearly as much as PPS. This is the hail bias of the PPS system, well known. Anybody who looks at hailstorms knows that if we have hail, our rainfall estimates are way too high. We're getting better, but we're not, we're not there yet. But this is just one, one of those gauges. I told you we had 800 pairs for KUN. That's one of them, one of those 800. Now here's Wichita. This is a radar that went in as a, a beta site, got the two-week installation, 
That's it. Go forth and do good, guys. And here, not much difference in the distribution. Also, you look at the statistics and not much significant difference. We're not really much better. And sometimes the, the errors are, are higher with do a poll. If you look at the whole data set, now it's not statistically significant, but showing slightly, slightly higher error than the legacy. So this is why I'm telling you that, that it's not always perfect. We've got some issues. There's some NWS sites out there getting the radar, looking at some of their estimates. Cleveland's one of those places. And they're saying, my gosh, it's not any better. What's going on with this sucker? We're still working with an immature algorithm, and if we have light rain, particularly we have a lot of things in, in the mixing level, uh, in the wintertime when you have rain, a lot of stuff in, in, in that mixing level, we can make some errors with dual pole. Here's what happens. I told you it was our QPE was rule-based. If we determine from the mixing level, al mixing layer algorithm, that, that we have dry snow, then we're going to make our rainfall rate just the reflectivity, the same as PPS is doing. But if we get above the melting level, again, dry snow or ice crystals, then we take and multiply the reflectivity rate by 2.8. Well, if we make a mistake and get the wrong kind of particle, we're making much heavier rain than might exist by multiplying by 2.8. It's not good. So we're going to have to work on that. It's not finished. Don, is there any indication um, to, the, to the operator when it's not working and when it is working? When it's no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Absolutely not. If, if you're, if you're uh, astute, you might note that some of the dual pole variables don't look right. Uh, that calibration number that comes out every volume scan, it, it maybe it doesn't look right. Uh, you might have some real-time gauge information that's coming in, and it doesn't look right. So, I mean, you can work to get some indicators, but there isn't, there isn't any place on the display that's going to come up and say, sorry, guys, this is a bad estimate. <laughs> We're not good at that. Okay, now to this deployment. Of course, we... We weren't on time. Uh, we've got, we went through all the machinations. We went to this beta test. We saw some of these bugs in the beta test, but come down to a decision. Do you accept it with some warts and wrinkles and try to fix them? Or do you say, nope, we're not going to accept this thing. Let's start over. In the current economic climate, it was judged that a start over decision would mean no dual pole for a decade, maybe. So was chosen to accept with some limitations, and we'll work on them. Hopefully I've shown you enough data to let you know that we're working on them some, and now we're on a very uh, aggressive deployment schedule. Now, I've got to mention one thing about this deployment. I told you we, there's a lot of good things we've done to this radar. Super resolution, another really good thing we've done to the radar you may not know about is clutter minute clutter mitigation decision making, CMD, done in the RDA, done with level one data, looking at the spectra and, and determining where we need to filter to get rid of ground clutter. Spectral components near zero radial velocity. Here's an example. This is through a clutter map, what we've used before, clutter map, clutter zones, cl uh, filter everything, which knocks down the precip. Here's a bunch of residual ground clutter AP, something that was getting through our map. We run CMD. Nice as a baby's bottom. Good stuff. <laughs> uh, CMD in the background has made the data much better everywhere. Mountain regions, everywhere. One problem. We didn't get CMD going until 2009. For the contract in dual pole, we had to give the contractor their baseline in 2008. So as dual pole goes in, CMD goes away. So initially, the color clutter filtering is not going to be as good. So another thing you're going to notice with the dual pole radar when it comes in is more bad stuff. We're going to put out a build sometime during the warm season of this year, a dual pole build, 
that will have CMD back in it. And it'll be an improved CMD because it'll use dual pole now. I told you there was all that good stuff about non-precip and knocking it out with dual pole. We can take advantage of that. So we're going to end up with a better CMD. So sites that get installed after July, August, something, they'll get installed with a new build now, and it'll be better. Okay, so here was September. When we just were starting. The first deployments were going on. We'd had the beta sites in, and we were just starting to deploy. First, we were deploying in the northwest. Green is deployment complete. Red is deployment in progress, and you can see where it was on that day. Another interesting thing, look at the really large area for one of the radars. How many of you are tuned in to Langley Hill? New radar, Western Washington. We had a problem. The old radar is on the wrong side of the terrain. We couldn't see to the west. Com complaints, complaints at the, at, the, uh, at the highest of levels, and we get a new radar. Out of parts, we made a new radar, put it in. That Western Washington radar now is providing data that looks out a long ways into the Pacific, relatively long ways, without, without blockage and problems to see storms coming. Another interesting thing is why that circle looks so big is there because we had to file a new environmental impact statement, not like the ones we filed way back there where we said we'd never go below a half degree. With this one, we said, yep, we're going to go below half a degree. We're going to go down to two-tenths of a degree. Turns out z z uh, you don't get much when you go from two-tenths to zero if you're on the flat ground. So we go down to two-tenths. So that's why the area is larger because you get quite a bit more coverage just dropping at three-tenths of a degree for that low elevation angle. Slightly, slightly not as bad a problem. Now, we're a long ways from doing that everywhere. We still have those 162 environmental impact statements that say we won't do that. And there's never been the corporate will to fight it because there was such a big battle over it to begin with. Some of you who are old may remember Mothers Against Radiating Kids, Mark, and the protests that they did for the radars and sitting on site and having to be arrested so that we could put the bulldozer in to build the site. Joe Friday on Montel Williams and totally being <coughs> attacked by people verbally, almost physically, about how can you do such a terrible thing in putting in a radar that's going to radiate people and hurt them. Of course, it doesn't. It's a pulse system. We only send a little bit of radiation and the, ra the beam moves. And stay in the same place. Well below any environmental impact hazard. The problem is it's all out there. All that stuff is out there. And the fight to change the elevation angles is far from over. With new radars, we can do better. With the old radars, I don't know how long. The next fight, if there is a fight, if there's a corporate will for a fight, will be at mountaintop radars. Because not too many people live around mountaintop radars. And they're the ones who are going to benefit the most. Because they're up at 10,000 feet looking even higher. And all the people live below that. Close to here is Grand Junction radar, which is a classic example of that. I go fishing in the Gunnison area. What that radar sees doesn't have anything to do with what I see down on the ground. Okay. So here is January. Here, here is right now. So we have a kind of a pod in the northwest. We have a pod around the Great Lakes. Uh, we got a bit of a pod going here in, in the Central Plains. Got some in the southwest. Weather Service, the agencies determine the order of these things to take it away from uh, when some of their peak season for weather was. Uh, the agencies have to share, give and take, just like we put in the radars in the first place. So all those things went into this schedule, and, and so it doesn't always look logical. But it's nice when we get pods of multiple radars because then you can do a regional composite of some of these good things. So by June, I think by June we will have, well I can't tell, but at some times we're going to have up to five deployment teams in the field. And deployment's going well. They're beating the two weeks. It's a two-week downtime. And almost every site, we're beating that. So deployment's going really well. You'll see then by, by June, we'll, we'll have a lot of coverage. Of course, a lot of areas where we don't. But, but coverage is really getting better. And coverage is getting good along the East Coast. If we have tropical systems, we're going to get some hopefully neat stuff on precipitation estimation. Then by uh, next winter, 2012, it's really starting to get filled in. Uh, the Gulf Coast still needs some help, some of the Central Plains, but other than that, we're doing pretty good. 
And of course, these coverage maps show you all those areas where we don't have good coverage. Mr. That's Aaron, another story. Yeah. I noticed a lot of those uh, June um, deployments were in tornado areas. And you're talking about a maybe a 10 day to 14 day window. Mm -hmm. Once the commitment is made to deployment, can, can they pull the plug and plug the radar back in for an, a significant event? Or are we no. No, it, it's down. I mean, I, I mean, you you unplumb this sucker. It's <laughs> you can't flip a switch and make it work till you finish. Once they take it all apart. Hey Doc, there is a one one to two day window where you know, say say a massive outbreak's forecast right right before we're going to take the radar down. Yeah. They can delay the. the they can delay the start. Yeah. The now start I think I th I think they've agreed to not ever you know com completely right. say we're not going to do that in this window, but they could delay a, a day or two. Also. There is a discussion of, about the possibility of taking a portable radar, one of the Oklahoma radars or one from somebody else, and putting it out of sight if a really bad situation started to come up during the downtime. But I don't think that's been finalized yet, just discussed. Well, the blizzard didn't stop the digital installs. They had no data from that day until it was ready to go out and be broadcast. Right. I would think that would be a huge liability. Yeah. I, I, I wouldn't. Yeah, I wouldn't want to tell you that areas of low po population density don't get the same attention as areas of higher population density, but somebody who was logical might make that assumption. Okay, that's next winter. So by April of 2013, we will have them all in. And the last radar to be installed is poor old Midland, Texas. Talk, talk about a poor lobby. They've got the worst, I guess, <laughs> and so they get go in the last. Okay. Summary, I do need to quit, is that deployment's underway after all these problems. During 2012, we're going to start producing lots of data. Not a good one during the blizzard, but lots of data in lots of different places. If it does snow this winter, we hope to get a bunch of that and see how that goes and Severe storms, hurricanes, tropical systems, whatever, we, the, the amount of data should grow exponential, exponentially. And these problems that we're having, calibration, algorithm, precipitation estimation, we are working on it. I know that's not as good as having it work, but we are working on it. Now, the last thing, and I won't go through all these in the interest of time, is that I've been doing work with modelers, and I gave some of this talk at a Warn on Forecast workshop just a couple of couple of months ago. And some things we can start doing with dual pole immediately as far as model verification, microphysics, I, I mentioned that. And there's a lot more that we can do soon with the new data. But a question for the modeling community, not just the Warn on Forecast, but the whole modeling community, is how are they going to use the dual pole data? Of course, there's verification. What you'd really like to do is you'd like to assimilate something. Are you going to assimilate the variables, the most native format? We made that a, a decision other places. Or, or instead, are we going to assimilate the algorithm output, the hydro class, for instance? Um, can we really get to these drop and ice distributions? I think there's fabulous potentials there. I, I showed you a couple of diagrams that I think really show the potential. Uh, maybe those would be some of the best things to put in the model. That's, that's the purest microphysics if we can get those distributions or, of course, other stuff. So I think that was the end. Yep, that's finally the end. I'm still around. was part-time, but I have so many fun things to do. It's been full-time for a little while now. There's my phone number, my email. If you have a question, don't hesitate to contact me. Paul may tell you the same thing. Uh, and, and if we can't answer your question, we'll pass along to some other people who I'm sure could. So if you don't have any other questions, I think we're ready to go to the break. <laughs>